James Rod Conroy. I'm here to represent Tommel, which is Tonga Offshore Mining Limited, and also Nautilus Minerals. I actually work for Fathom Pacific, which is a marine ecology consulting company in Melbourne. Um, and I was fortunate enough to go on the cruise this year for Tommel, so I was allowed or was asked to come along to this workshop. Um, first off, we'd like to say that Tommel recognises there has been a large amount of work done in this in the CCZ over the last 30 years and we're relatively new to this industry. Therefore, we don't have much experience in this field yet, but we hopefully are here to learn and um, collaborate with some other organisations and research groups uh, to help push this industry along. Um, I realise this presentation is supposed to be for presenting neofauna data, but we actually don't have any yet. We have a lot of samples and they're currently on their way to the lab. Um, so therefore I'm going to talk about the, the cruise that we did this year um, and the sampling that we did and some of the environmental data we collected. Um, the Tommel cruise this year ran for 97 days at sea, which started in July and finished in October and was on board the YMG RV Usama Moor Geology. Um, was funded by Tommel, but it was a bit of a collaboration between YFG and Tommel, and we both had science teams on board working together <coughs> sampling um, and geological interpretation. Uh, the crews visited five of the six um, areas that Tommel has, um, A, B, C, D, and F. We didn't do any work in E. Um, and we used three key bits of equipment, which was the dredge, a box core, and a deep sea photo profile um, photo profile I called the Neptune. The key goal of this cruise was actually for mineral resource estimate, so we had to work around the geologists um, to design the program, so the integrated biological sampling along with nodule sampling for the resource estimate. Um, this process involved collecting box cores along a set grid across the target area um, to collect uh, nodule samples, but also biological samples. We also ran, which are the red and blue dots, squares up there. Uh, we also ran the Neptune lines across the areas, which are the gray lines, uh, to collect video and photographs of the benthic habitat, but also to determine nodule abundance and weight estimates of nodules as well. Um, in a few locations, we also ran high resolution deep toe sonar so we could uh, build up uh, high resolution terrain maps and also sub, sub bottom profiles of sort of target areas that maybe trial mining might be running. Um, we also did dredging in a couple of locations as well. Um, obviously the key to obtaining biological samples was the box coring in this instant, instance. Um, on the trip we took two types of box cores. Uh, a KC design box score, which is the big silver one, which is 86 by 86 centimetres, um, and a smaller YMG box core, core which is 50 centimetres by 50 centimetres. Um, the two KC box cores were prototypes, so it was lucky that we had the YMG box core on board at the start because obviously there was a few issues and technical design issues um, which we resolved, and it turned out to be a very, very um, reliable box core. Core, and we had um, a running streak of over 40 successful box scores in a row, and no fails, and uh, very good recovery. Um, we occasionally switched between the two box scores depending on weather, but we tried to use the KC predominantly. Um, the reason for using the larger box score was mainly for geological sampling because it provides a less bias and less variance in the sampling, but it also provided a larger area for biological sampling as well. Um, the diagram on the left shows the catenary of our setup, um, which we also added a mapper and a water column profiler, so we could do um, water column profiles through every box core. And we also had a Niskin rosette sampler on the box core to take opportunistic water samples as well. Uh, um, the goal of our biological sampling was to have a systematic method that collected biological biology across all of, all of the target areas of the CCZ. Um, the mosaic on the left is a sequence of processing 
uh, the box score each time, which was once it landed on deck, we checked it to see it actually fired. Uh, we then siphoned off the overlying water through a 32 micron sieve, um, which the contents of the sieve was preserved in 99% ethanol. Um, we then collected megafauna off the top. Uh, we then carefully removed the nodules and washed them to collect four replicates of nodule fauna samples, um, which two were preserved in formalin and two were preserved in 99% ethanol. Uh, we then inserted cores for subcoring, which we collected two uh, microfauna samples, which are the orange ones, four meofauna samples, which are the blue ones, um, four macrofauna samples, which are the green ones, and then the brown ones were also sediment chemistry and particle size dis distribution. Um, the meofauna samples, we collected four replicates, which were horizons, oh sorry, the microfauna samples, we collected two replicates, uh, which were horizons at zero to two centimetres, two to five centimetres, and five to ten centimetres, and they were both preserved in 99% ethanol. Um, there was buffered ethanol as well. Uh, collected four replicates from neofauna. Um, again, divided at horizon 0 to 2, 2 to 5, 5 to 10. Two preserved in uh, formalin, two preserved in 99% ethanol. Four um, macrofauna samples, which were horizons at 0 to 2, 2 to 5 centimetres, and 10 to 20 centimetres. Um, two preserved in formalin, two preserved in ethanol. Um, and then we also collected uh, sediment chemistry and particle size distributions with the same horizon as the macrofauna. Uh, these weren't in all box cores, but we tried to get them through a lot of them. Um, so box coring was completed in four of the target areas for Tomal on this cruise, which was area B, C, D, and F, which we collected biological samples from most of them. Um, area B1. We had seven kilometre space box coring um, through the area using both the KC and the YMG box corer. Um, the KC was playing up a little bit at the start. We also collected Neptune coverage with four lines across the whole area um, and four MAC lines in the bottom area down there, which are the purple lines. Um, area C1, we collected box cores on a 10 kilometre spacing. Um, this was largely due to the fact that we realised we could determine um, nodule abundance and weights using a formula from Felix 1980. Um, so we turned to doing more Neptune lines so we could get more coverage of the benthic um, environment and more nodule coverage, I guess. Um, in area D2, which was our third area, we moved back to seven kilometre spacing uh, this is because we realised from the Neptune um, data that the nodules were partially buried in this area. It's probably due to it being closer to a higher productivity area, um, higher sedimentation rates. Um, um, we also covered this area with a bit of um, photo, oh, sorry, um, detoed sonar as well. Um, D1, which was our fourth area, we were still doing seven kilometre space box coring and taking biological samples from most of them. Um, we were able to use the KC larger box score for all this area as it was running real well. Um, and then our final area, F, we had 30 kilometre space box coring because we covered, wanted to cover the whole area. And then we had a small area where we moved back to seven kilometre space box coring. Uh, we didn't do any Neptune in this area because we are pretty much running out of food, food and fuel at this point. Um, so we started <laughs> heading for shore. Um, but the Neptune proved to be a very reliable tool while we were out there. Um, I know this is not me for and stuff, but it's, it was good data. Um, we decided to go with the Neptune that YMG has instead of an AUV because we were able to get pretty high quality video, and, I mean high quality photos. <coughs> Um, we covered 570 kilometre, nine kilometres, which gave us over 20,000 photos, <coughs> which we're looking to make public online for people to get access to. Um, this is just an example of some of the creatures we're able to capture. Um, from that, just 
on a random thing that we found um, on, a, on a hummock, we found this hexagonal pattern, which we found out is a paleo dip the dino in the dorsum, um, which apparently is, hasn't actually ever been seen. <laughs> um, and they've, they've caught it a few times and cut it up and never found the creature that apparently makes this pattern. So I'm more curious to know if anyone has seen this pattern in the CCZ before. No. Uh, um, and my final slide is just the environmental data that we're able to collect on this cruise so far. So across the top is all the samples that we collected from the box coring, or biological samples, which is quite a fair few. Um, so we're open to working with other research groups or organisations that would like to get their hands on some samples once they get back to shore. Um, we're able to collect 83 and 86 sediment chemistry and particle size distributions, which we're having analysed at the moment, which is spread across all the areas. Um, we're also able to collect um, 112 trace metals uh, and 112 pH samples and 98 total suspended solid samples at different um, strata depths throughout the area and across all the tunnel, across the targeted tunnel contract areas. Um, also able to get 108 water column profiles throughout the area for temperature and turbidity, um, 116 current profiles through the area, and also sinking particle flux because we have two moorings out there at the moment um, with some traps attached. Um, the ground is pretty much what we hope to do with the biological samples leading down to um, biotope mapping at the bottom. Um, we're looking to very, something very similar to what Daniel was talking about, um, using boosted regression trees and relating organisms um, identified to their geoforms and substrates around the area, and then using predictive modelling to try and, extract, try and build up models over the contract areas to predict where species are, and maybe target um, more sampling to those areas. Um, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Looking forward to the day. Thanks. <laughs> Daniel. So to what level are you planning to, to get the, the fauna identified to? Um, for the mayor fauna? Yeah. Um, I guess as, as low as possible. Um, some samples have been sent to YMG at the moment. And they're on the way in Melnix. I'm going to be starting to work with those. And I guess we'd like to get down to species level if possible, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure if that is possible. It's always possible. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you find any any zinder fire falls, these uh, giant uh, giant protozoans in the box balls or you know, um, uh, the images? A the large place? amount in images, huge amount in images everywhere. Um, which I've got some photos of if you'd like to see. Yeah. Um, and then also in the box score we in some of those megafauna samples yeah. um, they're full of um, those samples different. Um, but not huge ones, I guess. The biggest we probably found was about that big in the box right. score. But a few on the um, Neptune video slope were a lot bigger, 10 centimeters plus. Yeah. 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 Your, your megafauna images are very good, good quality and also very nice illumination for the colors of the network. Yeah. Uh, are you using, uh, what are you using to identify the animals? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we haven't really gone that far yet. Um, our logging on the boat was largely doing morphological logging, um, mostly because we had a very junior science team. There were a lot of Tom and um, nationals, um, so it was a lot harder to get down to taxonomic level. Um, but I guess we're looking to get some experts to have a look at it and try and see how far we can go with them doing morphological studies. In terms of your um, microphone sample area, yeah. It looked like you were taking the box core and then coring within it, or sub-coring. Yeah. So what size of, of uh, cores yeah, were you actually ending up with with the microphone? Um, there were 10 centimeter diameter cores. So, yeah. so for the neofauna and the macrofauna, they're both 10 centimeter diameter cores, and the microfauna we use 5 centimeter. So what happened to the rest of the core? Did they go for geology? Um, we collected residue samples, which the geologists call it, which were collecting 30 kilogram bags of 10 centimetre, 20 centimetre, and 30 centimetre. 
which is um, being stored sort of for geotechnical work as well. Okay. Um, but it might be used for something else as well. But we didn't. We tried to keep as much as possible. Um, we didn't throw that much back. There's about eight tons of sediment and, and modules being shipped at the moment back from Panama. It's a full shipping container, so yeah, yeah. we didn't really waste anything at all. Uh, it seems from the the area you you show you have some uh, multi beam uh, information. Yeah. Did you also collect uh, some backscatter uh, information? Yep. Yeah. So my question is now why you didn't try to to design your your program and the sampling location based on the backscatter? Um. Yep. I get what you mean. It, it's purely because this was sampling for the mineral resource estimate. So for statistical design of it, apparently seven kilometer spacing on a grid format for the modeling of the mineral resource was the best way to go. Um, they used backscatter to choose the areas for high abundance modeling. Um, but then for the modeling to be QAQC by the mineral resource um, statistician, it needed to be on a grid format, apparently. So, but otherwise, yeah, we would. If it was purely biological sampling, we would have targeted different densities for the backscatter. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was my question. Exactly the same. Yeah. You obviously are constrained by geologists deciding what's good for biology, yeah, um, which isn't necessarily the case. So, one one thing I think the biophoro group do need to discuss is not just the taxonomy and sieve size, but the results you get out at the end of the day, whether they're going to be meaningful for monitoring or yeah. uh, what, why are you doing this? Well, you're doing it to monitor and to, to know what changes. That can also be dependent on how you take the samples and where. Yeah. And, and so perhaps this uh, workshop needs to consider this type of grid sampling, whether it's ha uh, adequate. Yeah. The conclusion probably will be that it isn't, yeah. uh, and therefore that needs to go as a strong recommendation to help people realize that biological sampling it's needs its own structure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um,